the edge. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our Open Source Forum 2020 that takes place here at the uh, brand new Academy Museum. So we are upper of 50 people here in the room, and we have up to 40 or so people online. So for the people in the room here, um, if you can, if, you, if we're interacting, please make sure to use the microphone so that the people online can hear us. And for the people online, if you have comments or questions, please type them in the chat room or private message Emily Olin, Olin who will uh, read your message and um, bring up your questions to the room here. So I want to start with uh, introductions of people that are in the room with us here at the moment. So if we can go around and test those microphones as we have and uh, give us a sense of who we are quickly, your name and, and your title. I'm Emily Olin. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Academy Software Foundation. Uh, Daniel Heckenberg, RD Supervisor at Animal Logic and currently Chair of the Technical Advisory Committee of the ASWF. Uh, Eric Strauss, Director of Engineering at Netflix. Andrew Pierce, VP Global Technology at DreamWorks. Graham Jack, CTO of DNIC. Todd Previs, Product Manager at Google. John Leeson, uh, Director of Media and Entertainment Partnerships at NVIDIA. Eric Anderton, Director of Film Rendering Technology, NVIDIA. Uh, Gerald Chu, Director of Media and Entertainment at Microsoft. Rick Shahid, Azure Media Solution Architect, Microsoft. Greg Denton, Program Manager, Microsoft. Sean Looper, wow. Sean Looper, Senior Solutions Architect, AWS. Kerry Phillips, R&D Supervisor at ILM and Steering Committee Chair for OpenEXR. Larry Gritz, uh, Software Architect at Sony Pictures Imageworks. Steve May, CTO at Pixar. Ken Mosset, Senior Director at uh, NVIDIA. Uh, Nick Cannon, Chief Technology Officer, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Uh, Daniel De La Rosa, VP Post Production, Sony Pictures Entertainment. Jeff Kimball, uh, at NVIDIA, uh, DevRel Director. Travis Brown, Product Manager, Audio, Video, and Graphics Software Technologies at Apple. Uh, Breen Martin, Director of Marketing at Intel, and also the Chair of the Outreach Committee uh, in ASWF. Will McDonald, Head of Product at Amazon Web Services. Michael Johnson, Pro Workflow Architect, Apple. Luca Fashone, Head of Technology and Research, Weta Digital. Uh, Mike Ford, Head of Software Development and Systems Engineering at Imageworks. Uh, Chris Fiano, Senior Director, Autodesk. Darren Grant, CTO, Animal Logic. John Mertick, uh, Director of Program Management, Linux Foundation. Andy Maltz, Managing Director of the Science and Technology Council at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. And for the people sitting on the sides, uh, if you want to introduce yourself, please come to this microphone. Yes. And as you're coming over, I'd like to give an opportunity for Andy to give us a, a short uh, overview of this magnificent building that we're in, um, in and the Academy is our host for the meeting. Andy. So I will be the background music for the people that are coming up to the stage to accept their award. Oh no, that's that's next week. <laughs> um, go, go ahead. So welcome to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Uh, um, announced opening date real soon now. And uh, the next time you come back here, uh, you will see uh, some pretty incredible things. And now that people are up, I can stop talking. <laughs> Uh, Brian Cipriano, uh, Senior Software Engineer at Google and the Steering Committee Chair of OpenCube. Dominic Spina, Senior Industry Manager from AMD. Uh, Jean-François Panisse, represent the VS Tech Committee on the TAC, Independent Consultant. Robin Rowe, many companies and the Program Manager for CinePaint and running for Beverly Hills City Council. <laughs> Michael Bain, uh, Manager of Visual Effects Workflows with the Creative Technologies Group at Netflix. That's great, thank you. I see Ray Feeney in the room. Thank you for being here. Director of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. 
and a number more. So thank you for joining. Thank you also for uh, everyone who's online joining us. This is uh, the second forum that we have. We had one that a year ago when we were just a few months old as a, as a foundation and uh, now we're growing. So the purpose of this forum, which we intend to be a yearly event, is to give an update um, to the community, to our activities uh, that we have done during the year, and to have a little bit of discussions about also what's coming up next and what we want to do. So the agenda, um, as you have seen it, we're going to start quickly with at the State of the Union. We'll do that as fast as I can, then we'll go into the core of what is the what the foundation is about, which is the Technical Advisory Council and the projects that we have in the foundation. And then we'll have a moment after that uh, looking forward. So we mentioned this before, but we have remote attendees. So we'll use the microphone and remote <coughs> attendees, don't hesitate. If you have questions, type them in and we will um, read them at the appropriate moment. Local attendees, there's Wi-Fi information on the table. It could, it's going to be useful because we're going to start with a quick quiz. We'll have a number of polls during the meeting. And um, so this one is just for fun. But uh, what is your favorite movie? If you all go in that, including people online, if you go on your phone or any browser and uh, type the uh, address at the top, uh, pollev.com.aswf, then you can see the choice and choose one. And uh, please enter your um, your choice that will give us uh, an idea of our attendance as well as we see the total result at the bottom. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. It's an even race. 1917 is pulling ahead. Kind of our own Academy Software Foundation prediction for the Oscars. We're doing good. We will move on when we reach 50. 42. <laughs> Need a few more. I like my, my opinion. 50. Thank you very much. That's great. This will be recorded. So moving on. State of the Union, the second year. So we are at the end of our first year in a few months. Um, and we're starting our second year, um, as, we, as the board uh, discussed this morning, since we started in August, original, our original year was from August to August. We readjusted our fiscal year to be calendar year, and um, we had a few months gaps, and now we're starting our official second year. Uh, first off, uh, our chairman, the chairman of the board for the foundation could not be with us today, Rob Brito, but he sent us a uh, video message that we're going to play just now. In a second. So Rob was instrumental in the creation of the foundation at the beginning, um, the um, three years ago, uh, an investigation was. I'm so glad that there is. Here. I'm disappointed that I can't be there in person. Unfortunately, I had traveled, but I didn't reach schedules on this case. We're having a slight technical difficulty for the people in the Zoom meeting, so they're getting it adjusted. We're going to start from this top. All right. So the people on the Zoom could not see the video. We will right restart it in a second. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad that you were there. I'm disappointed that I can't be there in person. Unfortunately, I had traveled, but I couldn't reschedule, so I'm missing today's meeting. But I am really excited about what's going on at the Academy Software Foundation. We really want to make year 2020 the year of open source in our industry. 
And it's really based around three areas of focus. Uh, first, promoting and supporting open source software development, specifically in our entertainment industry. The second is to provide a thriving ecosystem for engineers in entertainment. This is something we really haven't had in the open source forum until the impact of software came along. And the third, really show that we can be the world class hosts that we want to be for those projects that we've already adopted in the Academy Software Foundation. You're going to hear more from those project leads uh, this afternoon, and I think you're going to be really impressed with the pickup that we're starting to see, not only in adoption, but also in contributions and progress we make with these projects. <coughs> uh, the last thing I just wanted to touch on before I run and let you have your meeting is I want to talk about USD because we all want to recognize it. And in surveys we've sent out, it's been one of the most important things that's been consistently highlighted for our industry. I just want to acknowledge this is a healthy, thriving project of a Pixar um, that a lot of us are very excited about um, seeing more adoption in our industry. And we reached out to Pixar, and one way we can help is to point our experienced engineers and our experienced users of USD to the Pixar support forums. Uh, right now, the Pixar engineers are fielding the majority of the requests and the questions on those forums. And it would be fantastic if we could come alongside them as a group of experts and provide them the support so those engineers can spend more of their day coding and less of their day supporting uh, potential USD users. So that's just one concrete thing we can do as an Academy Software Foundation um, to support this exciting and uh, healthy project uh, that is in our ecosystem, but it's not formally part of the Academy Software Foundation. This is kind of the support that we can uh, offer even before then. Um, during today's meeting, we're also going to discuss uh, forming a working group. If you are interested in participating, in that to work with Pixar to find out other ways that we can support USD. Um, that would be fantastic. But just to be clear, this is a healthy project. Uh, but it's just one that we've identified as core to our industry and want to come alongside them and support them in any way we can. And also stay out of the way where things are working well. So I'm excited about the agenda today. I'm excited for you to hear about the projects and excited to come alongside Pixar and help in any way we can. So have a great meeting and thanks so much. That's great. So the word from Rob, as we're moving back. So Rob's point, um, the audio was not too clear for the people online, so a quick recap. So um, first, he focused on staying the course and what we're already doing, promoting and supporting open source in our industry, develop a thriving ecosystem for engineers, and be the world-class host for our projects that we want to be. And that's our core mission, and we're very much staying on that, as we will see for most of the rest of this afternoon. But then about universal scene description, uh, we stated that this is an important open source project in our industry that we want to help and support Pixar as they're taking on this, this important project and they open sourced it for the benefit of the industry. We want to point some of our, or our engineers who are interested to go to the existing forum and participate and help the Pixar engineer, those of you who have USD experience have started implementing it already and help the community to understand USD. And then um, here we're going to form or we're going to talk about forming a working group on universal, universal scene description, which is a new type of activity for the foundation that, that we have done in, in some ways so far, but we want to do a little bit more formalized. And also with regards to USD, we want to stay out of the way where things are working well. We're just coming in to offer a helping hand in that important project. So 2020, the year of open source in the motion picture industry, I heard Rob say it. Um, in this uh, abbreviated State of the Union, I'm going to go through what we achieved um, in 2019, and then we'll talk briefly about our goals and mission that we set for ourselves in, in 2020. So in 2019, and if we go back a few months before that, the Academy of Motion Picture Art and Science, the SciTech Council led by Rob, um, and uh, with the collaboration of many, Andy and Ray Feeney and others, got together and decided to start an investigation around open source. As part of that investigation, and I must say that the Academy is continuing to help us, Andy and Ricardo and, and Kathleen from the Academy are here with us, and here we are in the Academy Museum, so the help of the Academy has been in invaluable. Thank you to the Academy. And as part of this investigation, we um, came to know the Linux Foundation. 
and they came on board with us and started explaining to us how open source is supported in other industries and became our partners. And ever since, and we have at this table, uh, Emily Olin and John Murtick and many others from the Linux Foundation who are helping us with the operation of our foundation. And we couldn't have, we couldn't have created it without them. And so out of the, in the, the investigation came the decision to create the Academy Software Foundation. And there, a very important group of companies came together, our founding members. You have the list. I'm not going to read them. But these companies were core, are the core of the people who kind of took a leap of faith, <laughs> put some money in and some commitment of engineering resources to get the foundation started. And with the, um, these people were these companies were infinitely thankful to your contribution. And at the end of 2018, DreamWorks Animation, who deserves a very special thank you, uh, proposed our first project, OpenVDB. Um, and they went through all the process that was entirely new to bring a, pro uh, a project into the foundation. Um, and um, that was, was hard, and that was the first. And that was a bold move, and we really appreciated that. You were a trailblazer, Andrew Pierce. And um, then Sony Picture Entertainment, Warner Brothers, the Blender Foundation, and the Visual Effects Society joined us. Now, 2018, 2019 specifically, started with Open Color IO joining us, and gifted by Sony Picture Imageworks, and our first open source forum a year ago. As, we mentioned, as I mentioned before. OpenEXR, shortly thereafter, and OpenQ were projects that joined us. OpenEXR was gifted to the foundation by Disney, and OpenQ by Sony Picture Imageworks in collaboration with Google. And NVIDIA joined us, as well as F-Track and Red Hat. In July 2019, Open Timeline IO from Pixar was also gifted to the foundation and Netflix, Amazon Web Services, Rodeo FX, Movie Labs, and our first open source day, which was our uh, meeting at SIGGRAPH, where we regrouped a lot of birds of a feather into one track. In September, then we had our open source landscape that um, Daniel will talk about a little more later. And we had our first um, case study of, um, or interviews of engineers behind behind the screens, and both Apple and Microsoft joined us at that time. And by the end of the year, we reached a million dollar in yearly funding commitment from 23 members' companies. And this is the group we have assembled here. And to all of you, thank you um, infinitely for making the foundation possible. We created the foundation to be, um, and we also have 17 full-time equivalent developers now on, in the wings, ready to work on projects for the first two years, the assignment of the full-time engineers are to any of our project or any open source projects, but eventually they'll move on uh, engineering for our foundation projects. So this is the group, and, uh, and this is an amazing group of pioneers that believe that software as our, in the motion picture industry is fundamental, and we need to get together for a certain type of software and work together. The structure of the foundation is like this. The Technical Advisory Council is the core of the foundation. This is where the engineering group uh, stand, led by Daniel Eckenberg. The governing board is there on the side to help the TAC clear the way and make sure that they have the resource to do what they want to do. And under the TAC, we have our projects that are built on a continuous integration platform. That's the basic structure of our foundation. Talking a little bit more about Open Source Day at SIGGRAPH, all the presentation that we did at SIGGRAPH are recorded on our website. So anyone who wants to get the latest update up to today um, on the projects uh, can go there and lis listen to those, to those recordings. We also have the behind the screen. This is one of them on Pilar Molina Lopez, an engineer at Blue Sky Studios. We're going to do a lot more of them. We want to highlight the work of the software engineer in our industry. You can go there, read the profiles, and send people to them as we encourage the the work of engineers in, in uh, the motion picture industry. So 2020, as I have four minutes left, I'm going to go into quickly our goals and targets. So first of all, we are building on the strong base and momentum that we gathered since we created the foundation. So a lot of what you're going to hear about today about the projects and what, what is happening, what's going on is our core activity. With regards to funding with, for 2020, we are focusing on general members. 
um, which are which is a class of member member companies um, that don't have to do a, as big a commitment either on money or in engineering and uh, bring them in bring more of them into the company which equates to smaller studios studios that are maybe less familiar with open source that want to um, that are maybe users of open source but not contributor we want to focus on them and explain to them the value that the foundation has and and bring them in and with that we intend to increase slightly our operating revenue by the end of the year which is very important for this foundation to be well funded to help all the projects in the in what we want to do and with regards to projects we are, of course, continuing our very structured um, uh, system or process for welcoming new projects. Any projects can be submitted to the foundation by exterior entity. The foundation is not going to take over projects or going to uh, take uh, um, projects that are existing. They have to be submitted by their owner, and that process is well documented on our website. And what? Addition, in addition, we're going to create working group for exploration of new and larger projects. We're going to talk about that a little later. And on the outreach side, we're going to focus on diversity and raising the profile of software, the software engineers in our industry. So working groups, what does that mean? So the working groups are going to be defined by the Technical Advisory Council. They're um, going to have to, in the definition phase, have a lead, have a clear goal, have a process to get to the goal, and a finite duration in time. And once a, a working group has been defined, it will be reviewed by the, go the governing board. We'll talk of practical examples of that a little later. This is our timeline for 2020. Um, we are currently in January at the Open Source Forum. We're participating in a number of uh, conferences and, and outreach activities throughout the year. Our other big meeting will be at SIGGRAPH in Washington, DC. And on that question, I have another quiz. Um, I would like to, the question is, do you plan to go to SIGGRAPH in Washington, D.C.? Because it's not in the usual location. So if you can please and take a minute to answer the, the poll. We are going to go to SIGGRAPH in Washington, D.C., the Academy Software Foundation, and we plan to have our second open source day. With that question, we're just trying to gauge um, roughly uh, how big SIGGRAPH will be this year in terms of attendees and if people are making the decision to go or not. We'll stop at 50, 48. All right. So majority is going to SIGGRAPH, that's good. And uh, we have a higher number than usual that are not quite sure yet. Number not going. Thank you very much for that. So, in terms of our higher level um, mission, if you want, we've seen this. Many of you here in the room have been doing this presentation. Our, the Academy Software Foundation is there to provide a neutral forum for open source software developer in the motion picture and broader media industry. The point that's important here is the neutral forum. We've never had something like the Academy Software Foundation in the motion picture industry. There are a lot of organization and committees and, and guilds and societies that put up meetings and do all kinds of things. The neutral forum for the development of software, this is something that is new. And this is something that we need to learn to take advantage of as a community. We already have a number of initiatives in progress, but we can do more and better and um, as we grow the foundation moving forward. Um, the mission specifically is about increasing the quality and quantity of open source contribution. And we've established this governance model, legal framework, community infrastructure, lower the barrier to entry to our uh, products. And I'm not going to go through the goals. These were our goals from 2019 for in the, in the interest of time. Continue, well, briefly, continuous integration that allows us to share open source build configuration, a clear path of participation and more consistent licensing. These are work in progress, but we did a lot of progress on these four goals. In 2020, as I mentioned before, we're adding two additional goal, explore new or larger projects through working groups and increase focus on developer diversity and inclusion. How to participate, you probably all know this, but our website is rich in information now and also make sure that you're following us on social media. That was my 
quick State of the Union, I will now pass the microphone to Daniel Eckenberg, who will give us the update on the TAC. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome again to those people who are dialing in. Uh, once again, just a reminder, if you've joined late, uh, please flag any questions or feedback you might have via the Zoom chat. So, um, as we have uh, a nice collection of people who've been very actively involved in the activities of the foundation and uh, some of its structures and components in projects and attack and so on, as well as a more a broader community here who's been uh, involved with the history of the foundation and uh, active in the uh, in the industry and community generally. Um, I'll give a little bit of a summary of uh, some of the things that have happened over the first year, but without going into too much detail. Um, in particular, I won't dwell on what's happened in the projects themselves because we'll be hearing from the project chairs themselves who will be able to dive into a lot of the specifics that really represent um, the value that the foundation uh, attempts to bring to this community. So uh, as David introduced, um, the Technical Advisory Committee uh, plays a role to try and coordinate um, across the projects and of course in our uh, founding process, uh, a key activity there was actually uh, adopting projects. Um, now that we have a significant number of um, effective and active projects, our focus starts to shift, of course, to other activities to support those projects. Um, and the projects themselves provide a lot of the energy to, to keep moving uh, the foundation forward. Uh, within this, of course, uh, the CI infrastructure was a big focus early on, and that is our first successful uh, model of the working group structure that David outlined earlier. Um, this is obviously an area where uh, it's of great interest to all of our projects, uh, but also is a good opportunity for us to bring in uh, skills and expertise from other people outside of the projects, which it's uh, definitely done. Um, it involves skill sets which might not actually be within any one of the projects themselves. And it also uh, sometimes has to be able to appeal for funding and resources and other things from the foundation. So the working group structures uh, serve that well uh, through the uh, association with the TAC. Um, as part of the process of smoothing and aiding adoption and also making it uh, possible for us to engage with a broader pool of developers. Um, a large focus of the first year was on licensing and contribution processes and I have a slide on some of the details of progress that we've made there. Um, another area uh, in order to try and really establish um, a good basis of best practice in a way uh, within, that, within the code, so improve the quality of code as one of our goals. Um, in a way that is actually stable and maintainable over the duration of the project, so not just a scrutiny that happens at the time of a project's adoption, um, was by uh, joining into the Core Infrastructure Initiative badge process and all of the projects that have graduated now, the three projects that have graduated of our five, um, have, after achieving those goals, maintained them. Uh, you'll see that those, the passing grade is clearly uh, seen on their website and that uh, indicates this is actually an ongoing process, an indicator of uh, those quality standards being met and maintained. Um, finally, another area where we are um, attempting to canonize best practice and facilitate project adoption um, is by capturing many of the projects that go, uh, many of the aspects that go into starting a new ASWF project and linking in with some of our systems like CLA uh, and with our CI system is by uh, setting up a simple template project. Again, that was work done uh, in the scope of our CI working group um, and uh, has provided a valuable path to actually uh, re realize and make visible some of those processes that, that came out of long discussions within the other groups. One area that uh, as we now move forward from uh, strictly project adoption into the longer growth of the foundation um, is developer engagement. So there are a few key aspects to that and I suspect that'll be a topic we talk uh, about a lot in the discussions today. Um, this was highlighted in the surveys that we undertook with our membership as being uh, one of the areas we really should focus on, not only for the sake of the foundation and the industry as a whole, but also obviously in order to serve the needs of the projects that we have, some of which have very clear um, timelines and roadmaps uh, to deliver you know, effective value to all of the projects that further depend on them, uh, but where we need to be able to 
use the resources and mechanism of the foundation to, to help and resource those things. Um, the idea of support for USD is another example where we might seek to do so somewhat outside of the project context. Um, another aspect of this, of course, is making sure that we broaden our engagement with the development community. Um, and in, in doing so, we can really try and improve the diversity and inclusion that happens in terms of the representation and also in terms of the processes and how we go about actually making sure that a broad variety of voices is heard. Um, all of our processes with the TAC are open. Uh, so I would encourage uh, you to follow through and follow along with the TAC mailing list and use that to ask any questions. Um, whilst we do have a core set of voting members on the TAC, um, the meetings are all open and we would encourage anyone to join uh, with issues. We have a process for an open process for adding topics for discussion and so on. Um, so uh, this really is done in the spirit of being able to provide this open and neutral forum for collaboration in ways that might not otherwise exist. So uh, a little more on the subject of developer engagement. Um, we've spoken quite a lot about outreach, about trying to reach people who might not you know, already be part of the community as it, as it stands. And in fact, uh, there is some good examples of how we uh, are taking some concrete steps to do so. Uh, Larry Gritz, who's here, has been um, leading a bit of a charge to set up the foundation as an organization for the Google Summer of Code this year, and all of our projects have subscribed into that process as well. Um, but another big area is, is what uh, has, has been coined inReach, which is actually making sure that we are able to uh, harness and appeal to developers already within our community and our engagement, and actually make it easier and possible for them to contribute to our projects and make it clear what the value proposition is for their organizations and other, uh, other points of access in, in order to actually appeal to those uh, experienced and uh, highly skilled developers. One aspect to this, of course, is actually making our projects accessible. So uh, another theme for our goals for the TAC this year, um, beyond project and process accessibility for project adoption, is actually to make sure that the projects themselves at a deeper level are more accessible by working on some of the web material and other presentations, which uh, are a little aged in the case of some of our projects. Uh, and also, of course, bringing our documentation and other processes up to uh, best practice. Um, I'll make another short note too about the working group as an interesting uh, piece of our uh, strategy for developer engagement. So where our projects, of course, um, do and can include uh, activity from developers outside of the foundation, um, and we encourage that, and there's many examples of this already, um, working group provide another model again for us to appeal to and engage with uh, developers and organizations without that necessarily involving membership. Um, that's important for the community generally, and it also allows us to start to engage with groups so that they can understand what uh, the foundation might offer for them in a, in a future point. Back into the details. Um, so those of us who were present for many of the early uh, summits and other processes that led to the formation of the foundation um, will remember that there were many discussions about uh, licensing and IP arrangements um, as bottlenecks and obstacles to contributions. Um, something that had occurred in many of our uh, projects, and indeed the projects we have adopted, were uh, slight modifications on standard OSI licenses. And through the process of both adoption and uh, second pass streamlining, we've managed to do good work to actually standardize many of those licenses so that they are much more straightforward and recognizable and pose less risk for organizations that might seek to enable their developers to contribute. Uh, this is uh, a slide that I won't go into a lot of detail about, but um, I will make a couple of notes about the path that we took for um, establishing the CI infrastructure, which now all of our projects are making use of. Um, when we were initially scoping this work, uh, we had um, a a goal or a mandate to make sure that this uh, infrastructure would be completely reproducible, repurposable, so that studios could essentially spin up this infrastructure inside their own environments as a way of dealing with some of the uh, typical sort of network security and isolation issues in our in our um, uh, in our environment. Um, as we progressed through this, we realised that there was a bit of a disjunction between uh, that kind of approach and 
what was much more familiar to open source project workflows and the way that many of the key systems uh, for CI and uh, software quality uh, had moved to software as a service style models. So we actually made the deliberate choice to switch this uh, to a workflow which made use of those services uh, in their public forms. Um, and this has had good value for us in terms of being able to allow for uh, workflows on individual project and developer forks to be uh, completely uh, compatible and to, to make use of these public resources. Um, it's also meant that we're able to leverage uh, software as a service um, through the open source arrangements that most of those services provide to do so without uh, running the infrastructure ourselves. So these are all important advantages that we've been able to achieve. Um, we've spoken a lot and we concentrated a lot on uh, adopting a number of key important and in some cases a little bit troubled projects in our first year. Um, of course, as we now expand our view to the sort of health and the broader ecosystem, um, it's important to be able to actually get um, some sort of a view and a map of that. So uh, John and others in the Linux Foundation were able to bring a very effective view of this for our industry by uh, repurposing some of the technology that came from one of their other projects uh, and form the ASWF landscape, which actually allows us to see how our already adopted projects fit in as uh, keystones in many of the areas of our industry, but also to see the many other open source projects that exist around them and that are within our mandate as the foundation to, to help and aid and support. And with that, uh, let's get into the exciting details of the projects. <clears throat> Uh, Emily has prompted me to actually ask some difficult questions. I wasn't quite prepared for that till later, but let's see, let's see what you've got. Oh, you saw this. I've got, and I've got a little time. So uh, would anyone like to stop now and ask questions? Of course, we'll have lots of time for a broader discussion after the project presentations as well. One thing I want to say about the landscape that Daniel just presented on our website, it's an interactive landscape that allows you to search for projects in our industry. So I invite you to go and, and visit it. It's a good tool to get a sense of the uh, many projects that are related to our industry and get to their website and you can view the landscape in different forms. It's been a, a great tool. Do we have any questions from the online group? Um, are there any guidelines, advice to help developers to convince their studio to open source some internal projects? At this stage, no. Um, I think that the, all of the projects that we have, and in fact, all of the community of developers uh, and others that are engaged with the foundation are obviously ready to um, have that conversation with any you know, interested individuals. Um, and I would... Uh, direct them to either do so, you know, through the public mechanisms that the TAC and mailing lists offer up, or uh, indeed through more private contact if that's appropriate. Um, and, and I added in the uh, chat um, a link to a resource. Uh, the Linux Foundation has a project called the To Do Group, which is a group of open source program um, office leaders um, across many different industries, um, big, small. Um, they put together a series of guides that talk about um, how you as an organization participate in open source, um, if you're wanting to kind of measure your open source developer impact, and then pertinent to this call, uh, conversation here, um, how do you get started in open source? How do you bring a project um, from internal to external? So um, I'd encourage, um, if this is something you're interested in your, in your organization, take a look at a number of these guides, um, and maybe we can also tap you into some of the experts behind them. Excellent. I'm keen to leave as much time for the projects uh, as possible because they have lots of good news to be able to share. So we may take the time now to pass over to, I believe, Open Color I.O. is our first project. Hey everyone, uh, this is Michael Dolan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we yes, hear you. Can. All right, great. Sorry I couldn't be there. Um, but I'll be introducing you all to Open Colorado and kind of um, giving some updates on uh, what we've been up to this past year. And then uh, Doug Walker will talk a little bit about uh, Open Colorado version two and uh, you know our progress in that this year and where we're headed this coming year. So if we could go to the next slide. 
Um, so just a general overview of what Open Color AO is. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with it, but um, it's an Academy Award winning uh, color management library targeting motion picture production. It's um, it's used widely in a lot of VFX and animation studios and both commercial and proprietary software. Um, the goal, you know, has been to have a consistent user experience across uh, all of our digital content creation applications that we use, um, you know, so that whether you're in Maya or in Houdini or Nuke or uh, Katana or wherever that your artists are seeing the same, you know, color appearance. And even though underlying data is represented, whatever makes sense for um, your production needs. Um, and then the system is highly configurable and um, it's intended to be very performant. So that involves hardware acceleration. We can process color on CPU and GPU, et cetera. Um, so Open Color IO was uh, started at Sony Pictures Imageworks and it was open sourced in 2010. Uh, it was uh, Imageworks sixth um, project of, as a part of their open source initiative. Um, and it uh, was very widely adopted following that. And then in, in 2017, after some you know quiet times on the project, uh, Autodesk made a proposal about um, kind of like um, bringing the project back to life and adding a lot of um, valuable functionality given you know that a lot had changed in the industry over the you know previous number of years. And so they proposed Open Color AO version two and had committed um, uh, full-time engineers to work on it until it's completed. And so that's been going on. And in 2019, we became the second project to join the Software Foundation. Um, and uh, it's been a, you know, a, good, a good move and the project's um, very, doing very well. If we could go to the next slide. So the right around now marks our one year anniversary in the Academy Software Foundation. And throughout this, this past year, uh, the meet, this meeting last year, we had just kind of gotten in and we, this past year we went through our incubation and we have um, officially graduated to adopted project status. Um, as you know, we had to uh, take care of quite a few details to make that happen, but uh, made the project much more better or much better as a result. Um, you know, just dealing with governance and, and licensing and, and lots of uh, just details to make sure we're, you know, adhering to the best practices for open source projects. Um, so our, our TSC or technical steering committee, we meet uh, Mondays uh, at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. It's open to the public. Uh, welcome anyone who has interest in learning more or uh, being a part of what Open Color is doing. Uh, currently, our uh, committee has members from Imageworks, Autodesk, uh, Double Negative, Epic Games, Foundry, Framestore, ILM, and Weta. So we have a, a good mix of um, membership. And we also have regular participation from Netflix and Linux Foundation and, and others as well from time to time. So it's, it's, been, it's a pretty good uh, mix of uh, in a uh, wide, you know, representation in our community. Um, we, this past year, one thing we did on our TSC was we added a new leadership role um, because our project is so, you know, tightly knitted with ACES and they're both these color management projects. They're both widely used in our industry. We added an ACES tech rep role to our leadership of our TSC. Uh, that's Sean Cooper at DNEG. And just to kind of help keep the projects in step and talking with each other. Uh, so that's been a positive move. Um, it, Part of this incubation this past year was a lot of infrastructure initiatives. Uh, as Daniel was talking about um, our, you know, working with a lot of the CI. And so we overhauled our CI uh, systems this past year and, uh, you know, in Azure and Sonar Cloud. And, and we did that uh, very tightly with the other projects as a part of the foundation and within the CI working group. And so it was a very collaborative process that I think all the projects really benefited from, you know, having each team kind of take part and, um, you know, lead the way on different initiatives. We're currently um, kind of um, setting up the first GPU CI usage uh, within the foundation and JF Panasets kind of leading the way with that. He did a lot of, he's been doing a lot of research and uh, contributing that to the project, which is greatly appreciated. Um, we also, you know, in, uh, for Open Color AI, we don't yet have Python 3 support. And so we're currently working on developing new PyBind 11 based bindings to add Python 3 support. Uh, which is uh, definitely needed this year uh, to keep with the VFX reference platform. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, so this slide is going to give you a bit of a, a glimpse into um, the activity of our project over the last year. This top graphic is our GitHub uh, yeah, activity over the past decade. And on the bottom is the last three years of our Slack community. So you'll see at the top that uh, our, our activity over the past year in GitHub has has been consistent and strong and it's, it's really grown and 
uh, we had 204 uh, merged pull requests this year, you know, um, which is, is great. And 24 issues closed and 19 uh, contributors, uh, unique contributors. So uh, pretty wide representation um, contributing, you know, code as well. Um, we have 87 Slack users. And if you look in our graph here, you can see there's about 20 to 30 active at a time. Uh, that's people who are contributing to the conversation and, and checking regularly. So pretty good representation. And, and one actually positive thing is here was we rebooted our mail list, which used to be a Google Groups, and it was moved to list.aswf.io when we um, became part of the foundation, which required all of our subscribers to essentially resubscribe. No one was carried over. And so um, we have 121 subscribers to OCIO dev and 179 to OCIO user. So showing that, you know, there's pretty good, um, you know, representation there as well and people that are contributing to the conversation. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Doug Walker to talk about Open Color Rio version two. Thanks, Michael. So greetings from Montreal. Uh, I'm Doug Walker. I work for Autodesk. I'm the technology lead for color science here. And I'm serving as the chief architect role on the OCIO uh, TSC. So as Michael said, we are in the midst of a big uh, project called OCIO V2. Uh, what I'm showing here is the uh, list of features that we validated with the community back in uh, 2017 at SIGGRAPH. Uh, the dark bars are uh, kind of where we were um, at SIGGRAPH last year and the light bars are where we are now. Uh, so as Michael mentioned, Autodesk has three full-time engineers working on this. We are merging code into the master branch on GitHub on a weekly basis. I'm not going to try to go through all the, uh, this whole list, but I just wanted to uh, pick up on something Michael said earlier, um, which is that we have, um, we're very interested in, in working closely with ACES, and we have a number of features on the V2 um, list that are intended to integrate more closely with ACES. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're just wrapping up support for uh, the new common LUT format specification that is part of the new ACES 1.2 release. A number of us are working uh, that are working on OCIO are also uh, very involved, very involved in ACES. And the way I like to think of it is, uh, ACES is the what, and OCIO is the how. So, in other words, ACES provides standards for what color transforms to apply and OCIO provides a great way for how to apply those in an efficient and flexible way. Next slide, please. So looking forward to the year ahead, uh, this will be a big year for OCIO. Our roadmap is to be feature complete with V2 at SIGGRAPH. Uh, and then the second half of the year, uh, we'll be helping people integrate OCIO V2 into their apps and doing beta testing. Uh, and our goal is uh, to be in the VFX reference platform so that applications can start shipping in calendar year 2021. Uh, next slide. So this is uh, how to contact us and get involved in the project. We're looking for contributors, not only on the development side, but also with respect to testing and documentation. So uh, if you'd like to learn more, please get in touch with us. And uh, that concludes our presentation. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Or do you uh, I don't see any in the chat. Um, if somebody has any questions in the chat, feel free to raise them and we'll, we'll move on. Three, two, one. Okay. <laughs> Next project, open queue. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Cipriano from Google. I'm the chairperson of uh, the steering committee of open queue. And I'm um, just going to take you through a, a, a little bit about what we've been doing with OpenQ and what our, um, what our plans are for the next upcoming year. Um, 
I won't go into too much detail here, but uh, for folks who don't know what OpenQ is, it is a uh, job management and scheduling platform. Uh, it is mostly designed for the media space, uh, rendering in particular, but really any, any kind of um, paralyzable work you want to do uh, can be put onto the system, whether that's you know, rendering, compositing, uh, running backups, and really any kind of work you want to distribute. Uh, it's a centralized system with uh, you know, a kind of centralized job management piece and database and uh, some software that runs on each of your, your worker nodes and workstations and uh, some client side of, um, pieces for, for interacting with the system, Python API, uh, job description uh, system, and, and a bunch of GUI tools as well. Uh, so it started, it's, it's been around in some form for a long time. Uh, started in around 2003 uh, as it was named Q3 back then at uh, SPI. And it's kind of, kind of built up uh, for a while over the years. And then around, uh, around mid-2018, um, Sony and, and Google started working together to, uh, to open source it. Um, so there was, that was a big project, kind of un untangling it for much of uh, uh, other SPI infrastructure and prepping it for the open source release. Um, and we wrapped that up around uh, January 2019. So it is just about, just about a year old. We've just recently had our one year anniversary. Um, a few months after that, then we joined the ASWF. I think we were the, maybe the fourth project to join and a little bit different than the other projects, which are uh, kind of uh, lower level dependencies. This is more of a multi-component system. So there's been a lot of uh, kind of interesting work that we've done to kind of uh, as the first in that space in the, the software foundation. But a lot of the tools that we're using are all the same ones that the, uh, you know, the rest of the, the foundation is using, uh, build system, release system, all that. And uh, so we've been able to kind of share a lot of that stuff as well, even though we're quite different. Uh, so some of the stuff we've done in the past year, uh, well, like I said, it's, been, it's about our, our one year anniversary. So the, the open source release was the biggest one, of course. Uh, that came along with a lot of uh, some initial packaging to help help folks get it up and running. Uh, Docker support was a big one for a lot of the pieces. Uh, and then since then, we've kind of moved along to a lot of the more popular uh, feature requests. So uh, one of the first things we put in place was a, a kind of arbitrary limit system. This is for like managing uh, fixed amounts of licenses and, and making sure you, you know, you're able to, to utilize your license pool properly. Uh, we've done, uh, we have full Python 3 support now, which was a big project. About 50% about of our code is, uh, is Python, uh, other 50% being Java. So uh, that was a big, uh, big push to get that all in place uh, before the end of the year and uh, keep up with the reference platform. But uh, that's all done now. Uh, and it was also a, a prerequisite to uh, doing uh, Windows support within the platform. Uh, so far, it's been all uh, all Linux based, but as of um, actually just this week, we announced our the alpha of our our Windows program. So we're able to run uh, basically run jobs on on Windows and and launch them from uh, Windows workstations now. Uh, there's some limitations there. It's still you know it's an it's an alpha for a reason. Uh, you know some especially around uh, packaging of the uh, uh, Windows components, logging stuff like that. Uh, but we're really excited to get that out because it's been a very, a very popular uh, feature request um, ever since we launched. Uh, and then the other thing that we've done is, uh, you know, in the past year, we've set up the whole, the whole project, project <clears throat> governance structure. Um, and I'll go into that some more on the, on the next slide. I've linked here, I'm sure we'll share the slides out later, but I've linked here uh, the release notes on our website that have lots of other smaller feature, uh, feature requests we've done, stuff like that. So yeah, the, the, uh, the project governance structure. So we set up the steering committee, uh, like all the other foundation projects. We have open meetings every other week. Um, mailing lists, which are also linked here, you know, user and developer lists. Uh, and there's a lot of good conversation that goes on there. Doing monthly releases of the whole system uh, for folks who aren't, you know, pulling from, our, from the master branch on GitHub. Um, and then a few of the stats here uh, that I've listed, you can see to kind of show what uh, of what contributions have looked like in the last year. And this has really been the, the kind of most encouraging thing I've seen about the, the, the project is that, you know, though the, uh, as you can see from PRs merged, the kind of uh, pace that, of which we're merging code and closing issues hasn't really picked up. The, the pool of contributors has, has grown quite a lot. 
Uh, we have a, re a really good kind of base of folks who are contributing regularly to it now, uh, whether that's code or docs or uh, just, you know, contributed to discussions and meetings. Uh, the contributors here are specifically like folks who have uh, merged code. So those numbers are all uh, really encouraging and, and going in the right direction. And it's kind of the, one of the uh, biggest challenges is new open source projects, I think, is to kind of get beyond that initial pool of initial committers and, and uh, you know, involve more folks. So uh, that's all good. Uh, a few things that we're going to work on over the next year. Um, better support for uh, cross-platform jobs with directory mapping, uh, full user management system with, uh, with fine-grained permissions, um, more packaging with for all the different platforms, uh, kind of make it easier to use and install and uh, run the program. Uh, lots of new documentation. Um, that's, we've been working with some tech writers to, to help us on that, uh, so that's all. Uh, going in a good direction and we're going to continue with that and we want to keep growing the, co the contributor pool as well so uh, and and then one of the other things that the CII badge that was mentioned in the uh, uh, earlier was that and that's something that we haven't been able to focus on uh, too much as a, as a kind of new project um, or at least a newly released project we've been focusing a lot more on the kind of initial feature requests that we've gotten so that's going to get uh, the CII badge will get more attention over the next year, uh, make sure that we get up to pace with the rest of the, uh, the projects. I think we're about 80% done with that now. Uh, and there's much more on our, uh, on our public GitHub page if you wanna uh, see what we're working on. Um, lots of stuff here if you're interested in getting involved. Um, main website, the docs, code, um, different mailing lists, and you know, all of our TSC meetings are open as well. If you uh, if you ever want to join those, those are posted on our on our public calendar. And yeah, I think that's about it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for OpenQ, Brian? Question. Do you have any uh, data on how many studios currently have adopted OpenQ? Yeah, that's something that we've that we need to do more work on is collecting that sort of data. We don't really have anything like that uh, right now. I mean, we have we can we can get us kind of a sense of it from the the contributions we're seeing, but it's not a, a perfect metric. So it's uh, something we um, should do more work on in the next year or so. Can I ask a quick question? Anybody here at the studio experimenting with Open? Sorry, anybody here at the studio experimenting with OpenQ using it at all? Image works. <laughs> More than experimenting. <laughs> Sony, a little bit of Netflix. Okay. We also have it at Sony Innovation Studios as well. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we did. We did. Just so you guys know, we did have to convert uh, Q3 into OpenQ, so that was part of our process too. So we had to go through converting it, putting it on a Postgres database, that sort of thing. So it's, um, but yes, that that process has obviously been started and established. It's working well. Didn't change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Luca was just saying the the way that we submit jobs has not changed. So it's it's done the same way. It's just there's obviously ad adaptations that, that Google and, and other people have made, including the Postgres piece that we had to move to. So. Um, on that note, I think uh, there, this is a sort of a point of general interest for many of our projects, perhaps OpenQ in particular, is to um, understand, you know, how widely used the component is. It's very easy to tell when uh, something becomes a component in a commercial software stack, for example, but much harder when it's a you know, top level application itself. Um, and that's something that has been raised as something that uh, in one way or another, uh, some projects would like the foundation to be able to help with, It'd provide a sort of uh, an appropriate mechanism for you know, studios and others to report their interest in use and support of a project so that that data is visible. All right. Thank you, Brian. And now for OpenQ, for OpenEXR, Carrie Phillips. That's right, you're waiting on me. Um, 
I doubt there's anybody here that doesn't know what OpenEXR is, but just in case, um, it's the high dynamic range image format that's standard in the, the industry and um, outside the industry, anywhere um, high precision is, um, is needed in an image format. Um, OpenEXR is an old project. It was originally uh, developed in the early 2000s at ILM. Um, contributions from uh, Weta and DreamWorks along the way. Uh, more recent history, um, <laughs> last May, um, project joined the uh, Software Foundation. Um, we formed the Steer Technical Steering Committee, um, rallied an effort to uh, deal with a, a bit of um, sort of deferred maintenance and, and uh, technical debt, made a, a 2.4 release um, just before SIGGRAPH last year, um, finished off the CII badge and was officially uh, adopted in November. Um, it's worth pausing to ask kind of what, um, what's expected of a project like this. And OpenEXR is not the kind of project that we really expect a tremendous amount of, of development and, you know, energy put into. Mostly it's just uh, maintain it, you know, reliability, um, stability, um, and uh, information about the project. So that's kind of our operating assumptions for the, the goals of the project. Um, there's... Um, OpenEXR is, I guess, probably the only foundation project that's widely used enough to have uh, security vulnerabilities uh, filed against it. So um, we've um, dealt with some in the past and have some more that we're working on now, along with some other bug fixes and should have a release out um, imminently, if not uh, next week, then uh, soon. Um, there's another little batch of uh, miscellaneous um, uh, maintenance and small features and some improvements to threading that we hope to do sometime in the spring. And um, <laughs> we're tentatively targeting another release around SIGGRAPH in which we would uh, deliver something that we've talked about of splitting the IMATH library out from OpenEXR and uh, distributing it as its own project. Um, looking forward a little bit, um, you know, the things that kind of aren't on our immediate platform, or, you know, radar, but, um, you know, we, we know are, are of concern to the industry um, around uh, performance, basically, um, you know, streaming performance. Um, one of the things we see is our responsibility in particular would be to provide a um, regression suite to measure performance. We have nothing like that now. So, um, so, you know, as we're fixing bugs, we don't really know if this is affecting performance or not. Um, another, um, we've had several questions around um, the the format of the, the definition of the file format for um, people that might be interested in um, uh, doing an alternative implementation of it. Um, not that that's something we're going to deal with, but it's just an issue that's that's come up. Um, another thing um, that seems within our purview is to maintain a, a library of reference images just as educational purposes, but as well as benchmarks for the industry. There is an, an OpenXR images um, uh, repo. Um, nobody's paid much attention to it in a long time, and I'm honestly not actually um, uh, very familiar with what's there, but um, revisiting that and, uh, and in that spirit, updating the, the website um, is one of the things that we're um, um, <coughs> intending to invest time in. Um, um, you look at the period of time when we joined the Software Foundation to SIGGRAPH and then SIGGRAPH to here, you know, kind of roughly similar um, pace of development or, you know, quantity of development except the time period is twice as much. So kind of from that initial burst, our activity is probably half now what it used to be. And that kind of highlights one of what I'd put out there as sort of one of the challenges that I think our project faces. Um, you know, um, like any kind of fragile ecosystem, everything's fine until a storm comes along. Um, somebody goes on vacation and it feels like our level of responsiveness that we can muster suffers. You know, none of us involved with this do this as a core part of our day jobs. We're all, this, it's a side gig for everybody and we're just doing it because we enjoy it. Um, um, I wish that our uh, pace of development was, was faster and that we had a broader um, uh, maintainer base. Um, 
Christina Templar Leitz is on our steering committee. Um, she's there because um, I knew that she would be good and I just called her up and talked her into it. And um, I think that's something we should just all resolve to do um, a better job of. Um, she's not an imaging expert, but I'm not either. And she's helped us out with our, um, our uh, uh, CI infrastructure and it's been, it's been fantastic. Um, so um, check out more at the, the repo and the website. Um, there's not a lot of activity on the, um, the, the developer um, um, alias. Um, um, we meet regularly on Thursdays and that's about it. All right, questions for Carrie. You asked a question as part of your presentation. What is expected of OpenEXR moving forward? Is, does does anyone have a an, an answer? Wants to venture an answer to that question? Is OpenEXR just fine as it is, or does anyone have um, ideas or suggestions for the group for the team moving forward? I just have a quick question, which again, and for this more for the room, is that. Once you have ACES and then you have OpenColor.io and then you have an archiving format, is there an, uh, <clears throat> a working group, which is how, the th how do the three work together? Because again, it's great to have the individual components, but then what's the combination of the three things together in capture, in archiving, in, and, and work in DCCs to be a question? I will defer to Larry on that. <laughs> Yeah, Larry, Larry, what do you have to say? Can I repeat, repeat the question? <laughs> Once you have, what you mean, sort of like you have the uh, monop monopoly game, like you've got an OCIO, you have Open XR uh, and uh, Asus in this, in this, within this purview. That that's great because now they're secure. But then, what would you do as a working group if you could steer all three at the same time for capture, uh, work in DCCs, and archiving? God, I'm really on the spot now. Uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't to, I'm just saying it was more of the question of like, what would you do? Because I think with opening XR, it might be nothing. But then the question of this group of why this group forms would be like, what would you do once you get a few of these things together? Because explaining ACES to somebody and then explaining them OCIO and then how it relates to the has always been challenging. Certainly. Yeah. No, I, you know, I don't off the top of my head, I don't have a good answer. Like, I think that is what we figure out in the future. But I, I think all of them being under this umbrella at least leads to obvious coordination that would have been more awkward before. But we don't, we, like, we don't have a plan for what to do next on that particular topic. I also think there's an opportunity here with, in the same way of like a USD working group, you could imagine doing kind of a case study of if somebody, you know, some studio was willing to talk about on this feature, this is what we did with these technology with these academy software foundation technologies and um if there was some sort of template for them and i'm writing a bunch of notes about like the usd working group thing of like what would be some examples of things you could do but for color stuff that's a you know if you can get somebody to be willing to be interviewed or be willing to sort of talk about it not saying this is best practice but saying this is what a studio did with it and we're happy with it or we're not happy with it. Yeah, that and might I, be and I think, I think that part of that will be overhauled and more clear as the OCIO V2 material gets rolled out and released um, because it's really, it's a major reworking. Um, and I think it will cause people to rethink sort of what capabilities they're taking advantage of and how to build it into apps. So we'll, yeah, I, I think it's part of it's, it's just pending like how that ends up Getting, getting right, but I think there's there's a value in kind of documenting the state of things versus this next one's going to be so much better. You know, you could at least talk about like, well, here's why we're ending up doing that is because we did this on this one project. We use this thing. It worked, you know, we had this, this metadata in the OpenEXR tags and that worked out super well. We could just pull it out in JSON and we were done. Or things of like, we tried to do it this way and that didn't scale. I think this has to be really driven uh, primarily from on the studio side as a as a 
way that we think about how this how this media and metadata moves through the production space. Uh, Netflix is su super interested in this stuff. Um, we care a lot about it. Uh, we're actively engaged in the production community around uh, driving towards initiatives which align towards standardization around how color should work um, because it's a broad topic internationally as much as it is within the local community about what best practices can be in place to guarantee the, the quality of the images that are coming out of the production space. Um, so I think uh, the our, the group uh, in our, um, actually Michael's a part of um, CTI, which is outwardly facing around how we focus technology uh, and drive it on the production site space and define uh, standardization around our deliverables is very active in this space and has a couple of color scientists on their staff who are, who are driving uh, and participating both in OCIO and ACES. Um, uh, we're certainly interested a lot in not just the OCIO um, uh, V2, but also sort of the, the next phase of, uh, of ACES as a sort of a, a marker point where we can get a little bit more or uh, uh, prescriptive about how we think about color. And I think some coordination has already existed across um, the universal group and others who uh, in that community who are interested in, in aligning the studio side around how this stuff should work will drive a lot of that conversation about how a working group would potentially sort of steer this package of, of, uh, of uh, technology in a way that is most beneficial for the, for the industry. This is Jay-Z speaking, uh, vice chair of the Academy ACES project, sitting on the outside until you let us into the inner circle here. <laughs> I had this Welcome. question about the compression of EXR, PIS-ZIB or PIXPAN. Um, will compression or is compression discussed in this inner group or do you leave it uh, to outside vendors, the compression of EXR? Um. We have compression, the, the compression um, capabilities within the library now were implemented by um, DreamWorks um, some years ago. And I guess we consider our mission to maintain what's there. And um, I mean, use this as a specific example. If someone wanted to propose a new compression mechanism, I think we would seriously con consider it. But, um, you know, as I've characterized the group, we're not a bunch of people that kind of um, are necessarily looking for things to do ourselves. It's more, I guess we regard ourselves more as caretakers of the format to make sure that if somebody wants to undertake an initiative, we should see that it's done properly. But um, it, it's not really a topic of discussion within the group that we should, should uh, actively pursue something like that. All right, so um, there's something here to uh, continue around OpenEXR and the synergies, Chris, to your question between projects. Yeah, I was just I mean, going to say that I think part of that, um, part of the component of that is the overlap between the groups. You know, Larry is on the steering committee, as is Rod Bogard and from um, ACES. So um, at the very least, people are talking. Synergies between the group. This is something we will follow up on. And now I'd like to move on to Open Timeline IO with Josh Miner. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Josh Miner, and my laptop just lost power. So I'm going to try to see. I can't see my slides, but I'll carry on anyways. <laughs> um, uh, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about Open Timeline IO. Um, and uh, wanted to sort of introduce the project since we're, it's relatively new. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, great. Um, so if, in case you don't know what Open Timeline IO is, um, it's an interchange format for dealing with editorial timelines. So the types of things you would see in a video or audio editing things, so clips and tracks and transitions, and that sort of thing. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, we supply uh, an API for working with those things, both in Python and in C++. Um, we uh, have a file format for holding all that information about all those tracks and clips and everything. Um, and then we also have adapters for uh, converting to and from a, a wide variety of other formats. So um, that lets Open Timeline AO um, interoperate with things that, that already exist and, and files that already exist. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, 
And all those things are in service of building a flexible production pipeline. Um, so at Pixar, we use that in, in our pipeline um, to interoperate between um, uh, Avid Media Composer and the rest of our, our um, tool set. So some of that's in-house tools, some of that's third-party tools. Um, and that's been a really, really great um, uh, project for us. Like we have a tremendous amount of flexibility that we, we didn't have before. Um, and we chose to open source the project so that um, other studios, other people could benefit from that, but also so that we could get um, even more flexibility and um, support for other applications and other formats that, um, that we don't already use. Um, so we thought that that would be a really beneficial thing for, uh, for the industry. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so, we, you know, we looked at um, open sourcing it originally um, uh, as a thing just to kind of reach out to the, the outside world. And, and I think that was largely su successful. Um, and uh, then we um, looked into joining the um, Academy Software Foundation. Um, and really our goals there were around um, sort of getting awareness of the project in the industry and getting participation from, um, from other folks, especially uh, from the sort of other software vendors. So um, we had reached out to um, you know, Avid and Apple and Adobe and, and the, the folks who make the sort of um, uh, brand name um, video editing software um, and gotten some response, but not really a whole lot of engagement. Um, and definitely since uh, our project joined the Academy Software Foundation um, and since we formed our technical steering committee, um, we've had regular um, discussions and contributions from uh, Netflix and from Autodesk, DreamWorks, uh, Storm Studios, and, and a few others. Um, and that's been really, really great because we've, I think, successfully shifted to um, what I would consider a community-driven roadmap rather than a Pixar-driven one. So um, we've achieved, you know, most of the goals of the things that we needed to do at Pixar. Um, there's obviously loads of things that we want to add uh, and, and grow it, but the, the sort of core um, goal of the project is working really well for us. Um, and that means that we can be more flexible and open to contributions from, from other folks. So um, Autodesk has proposed some changes. Um, actually, Netflix and Storm Studios are collaborating on an improvement to the library. So that's been really, really good. Um, and we've also had um, more uh, fruitful conversations with um, Avid and, and other folks. So I think that's been, been really good. Um, uh, we are going through uh, a relatively small license change. Um, uh, and the uh, Linux Foundation and um, ASWF have really helped to, to sort of navigate that. Um, that can be a sort of a, a tricky subject. Um, and some of us are not really used to sitting in rooms with, uh, with lawyers and talking about legal things, um, but that's actually been a really good process. Um, uh, so we're moving forward on that. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so um, recently um, we have done a bunch of work to the project um, to um, port the sort of core piece of it to C++. Um, and this is in the hope that um, it can be easier to integrate with uh, applications, especially um, third, third party um, you know, video editing applications or other just uh, DCCs in general. Um, uh, we've also improved our AAF support um, and Avid has given us some key sort of technical advice and, and help with that, which has um, been, been really, really um, uh, helpful. So, uh, things that we never would have been able to figure out otherwise. Um, and also Autodesk has been helping um, with some of the RV support and doing code reviews and giving advice and things like that, which is, which is really helpful. Um, uh, I mentioned a minute ago um, that uh, Netflix and Storm Studio are working on uh, adding image sequence support. So not just like video like movie files, but, but sequences of images. Um, and um, all those things are about to be released any minute now or any day now. Uh, and then in the future, um, we have plans to improve our, our timing effects, uh, image effects, um, these kinds of things. So support all the other um, attributes that you might see in a video editing timeline, um, as well as we're hoping to get more actually native integrations um, with software rather than converting to and from file formats, but actually have uh, plugins and integrations in, into this software. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you want to find out more, here's our website, documentation. Um, our discussion group um, is uh, not super chatty, but we have about maybe 50 people on there. Uh, the Slack channel has about 60 people on there. Um, uh, those are great ways to, to reach us and, and talk to us. Um, and I think 
you know, we're specifically hoping to get uh, engagement from people who really want to add in uh, support. You know, we'd love to see support in uh, you know Nuke and Flame and Maya and Unreal and all, all, all the uh, sort of name brand um, applications that you might want to get um, a, a timeline of, of clips in and out of, um, especially where there's some features around those that, but not really um, like a rich support for lots of metadata coming in and out. So open timeline can really um, help to sort of enrich um, that, that type of interchange. Um, uh, and yeah, so I think that's a, the sort of main points I wanted to, to, to hit. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Question for Joshua and open timeline IO. Anything online? No, nobody on the line. Um, there are a few questions for past projects on the line. I figure we'll get to those after open BDB and just to catch everyone up together there. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you, Josh, for Thank the you. great update. Appreciate it. And now moving on to open VDB. Hi. Oh, thanks. Uh, which one? All right. So uh, for those of you that don't uh, know or remember, um, open VDB is essentially three different things. It's uh, compact in-memory representations for volumes, things like think fire, smoke, water. Um, it's also uh, a lightweight uh, representation out of core on the disk. And it's a large tool set of uh, uh, supporting tools for this data structure. Um, so uh, one of the claims to fame for OpenVDB is, of course, its commercial adoption. Uh, there are a few new ones that came in this year in Bergen and uh, Blender. Um, we have a steering committee uh, with four members. Um, I think the, the big change this year is, uh, unfortunately, Peter Kruger who normally will represent DreamWorks, had to uh, take leave. It's unclear if he's coming back. Um, and then I, um, I left um, Weather Zuzel and joined uh, NVIDIA. Uh, we meet at a regular cadence, uh, one, one time a week. Uh, every Thursday, you're more than welcome to join. Um, we've had almost 40 meetings since we started uh, late 2018. Uh, and all the, um, the minutes are online. The GitHub repo, in case you're interested. Um, I'd say I've characterized most of the activity that we had uh, in 2019 as honestly bureaucracy. Uh, we spent a lot of time documenting processes. Um, we poured a ton of time into a new build system, uh, CMake. Uh, and then we simplified licenses, uh, talked a lot about security. And then in between all of that, we had the time for uh, three releases, two major releases. So a major release is typically when we change the ABI of the grid, not the tools. Um, and then uh, we've had uh, new external collaborations. So we're working with the Bifrost team from Autodesk. We're talking about potentially adopting um, the multi-resolution grid that they're using, which is very exciting. Um, and then of course, this is even before I joined NVIDIA. We're, we're talking to NVIDIA, so NVIDIA of course is interested in in uh, t trying to take some of these ideas and technologies to the GPU. Um, and I'm involved in this as well at this point. So, and I think the highlight last year obviously was that we were uh, the first project to graduate. Um, this is a, a list of projects that we hope to accomplish in 2020. Uh, I think the, the biggest, the biggest uh, contribution is from DNX. It's this uh, scripting language, just in time compilation language called AX. Um, but there are also a number of other things that you can see on this list. There are faster level set tools, uh, the sharpening, there are improvements to uh, the point support. Uh, there's also the idea, so currently today, VDB supports what's called delayed loading. So lazy loading, data is only loaded as you touch it. The problem is in the context of rendering, if your renderer touches everything, the high watermark is essentially the whole thing. So um, I've been working, um, on the idea of evicting pages again. So you can actually upfront specify the maximum memory footprint. Um, let's see, there's also, yeah, as I said before, are we really exploring the GPU as an as a acceleration platform? Um, and then one of the things that I'm mostly excited about is actually a contribution from, from Autodesk. Uh, if that will work out, it would be super cool. 
Um, yeah, in case you want to get involved, here are some links. Um, I also had a, a, a few, a list of uh, what, what I would call challenges. So as I said, we spend a lot of time maintaining the, the CMake and in particular window support is very painful for us. Um, both because the CI doesn't really support windows, but also because we don't have a lot of expertise on the TSC. So if any of you are interested in this, please, please reach out. Um, yeah, I think that summarizes it. All right, questions for OpenVDB? And or um, all the projects? So we have two in the uh, chat that came over here. Um, well, actually, no, we have an open VDB question. So let me hit that first before Ken runs away. Um, the question is, how has it been getting projects to adopt newer versions of open VDB and its ABI changes? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. How, how is it different from? I think, how has it, it been going? Like, what's been the uptick of getting, um, you know, new adoption on newer versions of OpenVDB and the various ABI changes that have happened? Like, are you seeing people moving over to the new versions or? It's traditionally, it's, it's quite slow. It, it looks like most of the commercial packages are about a year behind. Uh, but yeah, other than that, it's been pretty smooth. Not, not a big change there. I think that's the only, um, that's the only one we have for OpenDVDB. I'm going to roll back here a little bit. Um, there's a question, I believe, from OpenQ. Uh, for OpenQ, has the OpenQ project looked at working with online farm vendors for spreading the project? Um, so, can you, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat that? Um, has the OpenQ project looked at working with online farm vendors for spreading the project? Um, to, I'm not sure I understand. Like online farm vendors, is, I think of it like just like cloud render farm kind of things. Yeah, no, we, we haven't done any of that yet. Um, but we are kind of like, uh, we are looking at ways that we could kind of merge, um, you yeah. know, Merge OpenQ with other cloud environments, and and you know not only make it you know we have good good representation from all the major cloud providers uh, on the TSC, so uh, we're definitely trying to make it as cloud friendly as possible uh, and as hybrid friendly as possible. Uh, so yeah, that's something that, that we'll probably look at more in the future. And we have one. Um, this is a USD related question. Um, it's I don't have firsthand experience but understand that interoperability of USD between facilities is difficult. Will the Pixar working group address interop issues? I would say hold that question for the working group question that we're going to address um, here on specifically USD. We have, we'll have time in the discussion time for, okay. for USD. And there's one more around uh, gaps um, in the landscape for open source software. Um, it was about the whole overview. Are there, in your opinion, major gaps in the current landscape of open source software for the motion picture industry? Is it a goal of the ASWF to somehow think about it? I don't know if this is getting into your next section as well. I can speak uh, somewhat to that. Um, obviously, that's something that, uh, changes and evolves over time and this audience um, is uh, in a very good position to actually help us define or identify those areas. Um, in general, you know, we can think about those gaps in a number of different ways. Uh, in some cases, it's because, you know, a new uh, technology space has opened up and there's simply, you know, no project that has uh, started to move into it. In other cases, it's because, you know, a particular set of technologies is close to becoming um, a commodity. You know, we may all have proprietary solutions and that's not something we see value in maintaining. Uh, and similarly, the same can apply to something that, you know, for which there are commercial solutions, which for whatever reason don't necessarily make sense in a commercial space anymore. So um, it's, it is definitely part of our mandate to um, be a space for those conversations to occur. Um, and I think our membership has been uh, very active in actually identifying some of those opportunities. Um, we did have some specific 
uh, suggestions from our last round of member surveys, um, and I think we'll talk about those in the in the next section. Perfect. That catches us up in the chat. Okay. So last chance for questions about the projects. I think we got a great yes. I I just kind of have a general question. I'm I. First of all, I think it's remarkable where the foundation is after one year. And so just hats off to everybody who's helped lead this and all the committees. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite amazing, very impressive. Thank you to everyone, the members and the, and the TSCs. And the it's, uh, yeah, I almost, it's almost, I almost can't imagine it now not existing and it's only been around for a year, so it's very cool. Um, my question was about, and I don't know if this was touched on a little bit by some of the project updates. I was wondering about like how we feel like is there, we're getting the amount of engineering support and an investment that we were kind of hoping for with the projects that we have thus far. In other words, you mentioned that we've got 23 members now contributing money and, and I don't know how much of that translates into actual engineering to support the different projects, how much we're getting also the kind of the, the FTE equivalent contribution from the different members. It, I just kind of curious like what the general feeling is like, are we getting the kind of engineering support and boost from the foundation for these projects that we were expecting. I know it's, it's kind of early still in the process, but I'm just kind of curious. Good question. Any answers from the group? Speaking, speaking for OpenVDB, I would say absolutely. All right. Yeah, just having any attention on OpenEXR is the benefit of this. Great. Yeah. So I, I have a comment because um, I want to echo what, what Steve said. I think it's pretty amazing what's been accomplished in the foundation so far, but a lot of it has been a transition to some commonality and stewardship and a bunch of other things. I really believe that when we transition to when the FTE equivalents are applied to the projects in the foundation as opposed to just any open source project, that I think that that is, uh, for me, a major part of what I think the discussion should have because I think that will change the nature of stuff. I think people who are contributing at the higher level of putting the dollars forward will be able to see value backed for what it is that they're doing and there's a, more of a direct correlation. So I think that the focus on the FTE and seeing return from that is really going to be centered around when we can make that transition. And that's, I was going to bring up a little later, is I think that that's something that the foundation needs to be talking about. Maybe not solving here, but as part of the governing or the tax or the other activities, that has to occur before people start losing momentum over some of that. Yeah, I, I just want to add that um, I, I agree that it will be great. Like right now, I think we don't have any metric on whether the members are putting the FTEs in at all. I, I mean, I, we can see that a lot of them are, but like there's no, it's not recorded anywhere. Um, but uh, I, I'm less concerned about what you just mentioned about the in project out project, because as far as I know, like I haven't come across anyone who said, um, we are doing our FTE, but in a non-org project. Like, I don't know any instance of, of someone claiming that they're putting their FTE outside. So, I, like, I don't know if that'll be a major transition or not. On to USD or Alembic or stuff like that. I, are they counting that? Or do they claim that that's their FTE? Yeah. We've never asked the question, to be honest. I mean, I think, exactly. except in the case of the survey that we ran recently and... Uh, a couple of people did actually suggest projects that were sort of out of our core set, but at the same time, as I think everyone has noted, we haven't, uh, I think the discussions around this, particularly at the time when we didn't have a significant number of projects, obviously didn't create a tight exclusion on what you know, was exactly. valid activity. It was never time to do it before now, and it may not be now, but part of both the value question for people who take the risk of putting their project that's near and dear to their heart into the foundation and people who are putting up the funding to be able to correlate some of that a little bit together, I think is going to be a critical part of the next phase of evolution of this group. 
not detracting from everything that has been done. It's just, it's phenomenal. I mean, like Steve says, it's hard to imagine that this hasn't always been here. And maybe just a little bit of lead time for that transition. Cause again, it's, you know, people are putting the, um, resources on things they care about, but if there is a transition to, Hey, it's a full-time engineer and that engineer will be, their job will be to work here. Just, I guess it would just be like, Hey, that's a goal for a year. And then they, people will need warning for it. That's, it, that's yeah. why I'm saying it needs to, it, there needs to be a clear path to this, however, and whenever you do it. But it in the case of open EXR, um, it's kind of an example of, uh, getting the band back together again, um, just calling up the people and talking them into going on tour. Um, I think what we, what we haven't been successful at or don't have much of a mechanism of doing is identifying a chunk of work that needs to be done that we don't have the capacity of doing and going out and seeking somebody to do it. Exactly. I think that's what my bigger question goes to is like, what, what is our capacity to, as we, as we look forward, like what is our capacity to adopt new projects? Do we actually have enough resources for the projects that we currently have? I know we want to we want to do more, but I also want to ensure that like the the projects that we have are successful and and thrive before I don't know we get too far ahead of ourselves. Yeah, to Chris's point, I, we never thought of one FT as a single person committed to this because the expertise of the various projects lies in different individuals. It's more that you know there's two months of this guy and three months of that girl and what have you, right? And so it's a uh, it's, it can become nuanced when you start and thinking of it that way. I have a team of 200 and you know, there's a few weeks of this person and seven weeks of that person and what have you. For us, and I think that's the best way to do it. Like it provides the most value to the, to the various endeavors. And then, and then the other thing to mention is just that um, beside the FTE commitment from, uh, from the premier members, um, there's, there's a large budget. There's funds that are being committed uh, by by uh, premier and general members alike. And those don't all go to just funding these meetings and chairs and, and, chairs and tables and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, but um, they also can go, start to go to, and I think that's one of the things that we'll be focusing on in terms of developer engagement this year. They can also go to funding some of those things that are, here's this project in order to get this project over into Academy Software Foundation. This is the kind of help, the support that they need, that they look for in order to do that, and that's a reason to pull them in. Um, that's, I think that's exactly what we're here to do. So uh, I have a couple of comments to make. One is that um, I was struck by the fact that I think in the survey results, um, OpenEXR figured as the project that uh, was apparently most, uh, you know, the, the most common target of people's self-reported, uh, you know, FTE, uh, contributions, but at the same time, it was also uh, a project where Kerry called out the fact that you know he feels, uh, in some ways, the lack of that engagement, and perhaps that speaks to the difference between a more diffused uh, kind of you know we're, we're, we're there, we're involved, but we're not necessarily actually um, committable as a resource that we were you know, discussing in that in that conversation. Um, the other to sort of follow that through, I think it is very important that we work out. Um, ourselves, how we're going to try and, you know, make these transitions or uh, make best use of the commitments that we have. But I suspect that this is something that arises in all of the communities and foundations that the Linux Foundation has, has dealt with. So I'm very interested to sort of hear what experiences we may be able to learn from. That's where I come up with an answer, right? Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is a common thing. Um, you know, projects can only really move as fast as the contributors and committers allow them to. Um, I think there's certainly a number of different aspects of things that I, I think at the first set is just setting a level set. Um, one of the things we started doing with all of these projects earlier this year is um, putting um, one of our new tools called Dev Analytics um, on each of the projects because we wanted to answer the first question of what does the diversity look like in each project from a contributor standpoint? Because um, what we see is a healthy, sustainable project is if any one of the major organizations contributing can walk away and the project can continue on. So if all, so if we look at an open VDB and three quarters of the contributors are from DreamWorks, that's not very sustainable. Um, but if one third are, then that is sustainable. 
um, and especially if that's a growing amount over time. So um, we're combining this with also looking at, uh, you know, sort of different methodologies, such as just sort of like what's the economic value to recreate some of this. I've done some early analysis of that that I want to hopefully share with the tax sum. Um, but I think it all hones back into that same sort of thing of, you know, I think there's one question here of how can we assess what sort of the FTE or whatever the contribution for organizations um, looks like. Um, and then on the second of how can we grow that pie more and assess whether are we meeting the demands that, that the project needs for growth or are we behind the curve. Um, so more to come there, but I think we're starting at the analysis point. Um, and I would say we did ask in our member survey about where the FTEs were going. It was a fairly even split across the five projects. And for people who were contributing to other projects like USD, they were still also putting resources into our projects. So it wasn't like, I don't think we have any one member who's putting their FTEs towards completely towards a project outside of the foundation. Um, so, you know, the big ones obviously coming up being USD for the most part. I think there's some also, also some evidence of people not contributing to a specific project, but to that CI/CD infrastructure, like we heard JF called out earlier today, and uh, certainly we've done that our fair share of that on the animal logic side. Yeah, contrib contributions mean a lot of different things to projects. One is writing code, another is writing documentation, another is helping coordinate efforts and in infrastructure, um, and there's all sorts of expertises to make this successful. So, and also think, there's things. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And it's a hard question that every project out there tries to wrap their head around and that's something that we're looking to spend more time and get the right data points so we can assess that for these projects going forward. Yeah, and there was a super useful call, I forget, a couple of months ago about use cases and deployment scenarios and examples that all of these projects are a little light on. Mm -hmm. And again, that, you know, you gotta remember that these are contributions and it takes time to put them together correctly and have examples that are relevant to people. Like it's it's not easy. I think it's harder than docs, to be honest. To have yeah. good examples, to have three good examples is easy, but to have examples that are useful to people is actually very hard. Yeah, and there's also those of us at companies that uh, have large legal departments and want to make sure that work that you've already done that you want to contribute, you need to, you know, run it through a lot of things. So, um, just saying. <laughs> This is why we've spent a lot of time with the projects and licensing over the past year. I think you saw little dabbles of that in some of the slides, and um, I applaud the TSE chairpersons who um, attempted to talk to that because I know it's not a native thing. But you know, I think as this foundation was founded, that was one of the big goals: having a common contribution framework, and especially having people on common licenses and especially OSI compliant ones, so you're not having to go to your lawyers and explain to them why is this weird license coming up that you've never heard of that you're trying to contribute to? Yeah, it's just a lot of work has been done. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has been shared yet. Exactly. Or that it can be, because yep. you might not be able to. Yep, exactly. We're not finished. We're just starting. Exactly. So this um, it's a great line of discussion. It's the core of what we do. So we want that, conti that discussion to continue here or after the fact um, in terms of our in terms of our looking forward discussion here these are proposed topics in the last uh, 45 minutes that we have for discussions that we um that i'd like to bring up and um we'll also have at the end a a, a general what do we miss questions in terms of topics um so Moving on on the first one, with regards to survey, we mentioned that we surveyed ourselves in a number of ways. Um, and um, there is a proposal for a survey from Nick Cannon that um, I would like him to talk about here, give us a brief description from the VES, VFX reference platform point of view. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. Yeah, and then this is really an early idea, so it's, uh, but it's <laughs> driven primarily by two things. One is um, uh, we, we, we hope to make some more changes to the VFX reference platform this year with a focus on broadening support from Linux to other major operating <coughs> systems as well. Uh, and we're also seeing you know, uh, vendors and software providers making decisions uh, uh, based on incomplete market data. Uh, and you know, uh, uh, Linux is still a very important platform for 
uh, this industry. And uh, we need to make sure that we're advocating for that and people understand the, the, the size, the importance of that market, uh, as well as the growing uh, Mac and, and Windows base as well in, in, in some more studios. So the, the idea would be to uh, go out and do a, more of a studio survey um, and uh, try and collect some kind of comprehensive information without making the survey so long that everyone gets turned off doing it, um, to try and encourage people to participate uh, we would uh, anonymize, or actually, we'd, we'd only use release, uh, we'd, we'd guarantee confidentiality and just report out aggregate data. And the kind of things we're thinking of uh, of collecting are sort of operating system versions. What are, you, what are you on currently? What do you plan to, uh, to to move to over the next year or two? Uh, window manager, specifically on Linux, is is a thing. What we're starting to see is that, um, that, we, that we haven't been getting premium drivers for Linux because. Vendors are confused by all the Windows managers in use, and so they think it's 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 not worth the effort to try and uh, do premium drivers on that platform. Um, and we think we can we can, we can persuade them otherwise. Uh, so number of hosts of different OSs and memory size and uh, vendor farm size, split between cloud and on-prem, GPU. The, you know, we have a whole list, and probably we can't do can't do everything. Um, but we've been but but the idea is you know it's. Is there, do we think it's an interesting thing worth doing? Certainly from a VFX reference platform, VS Tech Committee, we, th we think it would be valuable data to share openly with, with, across the industry, across studios and, uh, and vendors and providers. And could we do this in conjunction with uh, having a software foundation uh, to give it some increased credibility and reach and, and, uh, as well. And maybe if successful, this is something we could do every year or two, try and get a picture of how the, the market is, is, is evolving and how the sort of infrastructure and platform is evolving over time. Um, so that from a, for, again, from a having software pack foundation perspective for all the projects, they know what they're trying to target and, and a better understanding of what, where the studios are going so they can target the, the software more appropriately. Um, so, uh, you know, th th those are some of the ideas I can, you know, if anyone can grab me afterwards, I can talk about specifics, about some specific examples of why we think it's going to be beneficial. So as a general statement, um, the Academy Software Foundation would would very much would be glad to team up with the VES reference platform, VFX reference platform to to do a survey like that. And if we if we think collectively that it's a good thing to do, and that would be a, a question for the group. And in terms of what Nick mentioned, uh, also contribution of are there this may be the opportunity to ask the studio a, a number of important questions. Um, if there are other data points that you think would be useful. We'd be glad, we'd be glad to engage with, um, with your group, Nick, to, uh, to make a, a joint survey. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, I'd encourage you also to include the, uh, the projects under the committee here to see what versions are actually running. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. Actual software versions, what are they using, what are they plan to use? Yeah. yeah. Right. I would say this, yeah, this is an excellent opportunity to try and uh, meet that other question that we heard about, which was studio uptake of uh, some of our open source components too, potentially. Um, right. Would we anticipate making this something that we could uh, attempt to repeat over time? It sounds like this would actually yeah. be, you know. No, no I, I think a lot of the value in this is seeing trends over time. So I, I think if we, if we can get it right and have some consistency year on year, then yeah, I think that'd be useful. Okay, so we'll take that on. Uh, diversity and inclusion. We talk a lot about that topic, and um, we know that we have to to uh, transform moving forward our our uh, demographic. Let's call it that way at the foundation here and in the group around the table. Um, I have a, this is a poll here and a general question. Some of you have experience more than others in how to improve diversity in your organization. So this is a poll. If you take your phones and uh, log again, you will see these four pre-written um, pre um, suggestions in terms of uh, how we can improve diversity. On this poll, you can vote for the, um, each one of the item that is there, move it up, move it down, and you can also type new ones. So if once you're there, if you can, um, rate these four points, and, and if you have further ideas about diversity, please feel free to um, to add them. And as we're doing that, if you also have some um, 
success stories that you would like to share with us in any, um, any program or any actions that you took that brought um, diversity to your organization, that would be the time to share with the group. No one has suggestions. I'm going to put someone on the spot. I'll speak up and say, I think one of the challenges we've had so far in terms of identifying people, I mean, I see the mentorship program is getting really high up there. Our, and I love that idea. The problem is, is that we don't have anybody right now to be the mentors. So, I mean, we haven't even identified that in terms of, you know, gender, especially we haven't identified that many women within the foundation. And I think one of the problems is I think there are a lot more women and other diverse, you know, people working on the projects, but because we only have one person interfacing on the TAC, a lot of times we don't even know who those people are. So even having our own members just say, hey, these are the people on my team internally who are working on the project, that could be potentially good to highlight on the website or be involved in things, I think would be good. Or, you know, and even outside of our members as well, I think sometimes people are just so buried within their organizations, it's hard to find them. I do think if you want to do mentorship, I mean, this is, we've had this conversation before about, you know, in my particular case, reaching inside my company to get people to come up this, and there's a big time commitment to be involved with this, but there are, I mean, I can think of five, um, you know, people of different genders than me that I could reach out to immediately inside the organization and say, hey, would you be, you know, you're a software developer, would you be willing to mentor someone in this? And maybe, you know, I probably would get one or two who would yeah. do that. So I'm not necessarily the mentor, I'm not necessarily the right person that you want to be the mentor if we're, especially if we're trying to do it in this way, but for people who want to see themselves in something, I would imagine most of us could ask other people in their organization that that either are unable or unwilling to do the commitment to be on the TAC or to be on whatever, but they might be willing to be a mentor. Yeah, that's great. Or just a contributor to the projects. Yes. Right? I mean, we, uh, every, one two, of, two. Yeah, absolutely. every one of our studios has, just to keep using gender as the example, but it's not the only one, has a bunch of talented women developers, but like those aren't necessarily the people who have had their fingers in the open source projects, but they could be recruited to do so if it was important. You yeah, know, I was just speaking specifically to the mentorship thing. Yeah. Like we don't have to be the mentors. We can go find mentors in our company. Yeah. Um, one, this is just to repeat a, a note that's come up in previous discussions, uh, but you know, one potential limitation of course to mentorship would appear to be the fact that at least in some parts of the structure there are, you know, there's a representative aspect to um, the you know, positions. So for example, on the governing board and the voting positions and the TAC. Um, what's been presented is a very practical uh, a way of, you know, opening that up somewhat is to have essentially, you know, job share for those positions from companies or other roles where you, where, you know, the mentor and uh, mentee would basically take turns or might sit together in that context, but sort of only have a single uh, representative voice for the purposes of voting and other things. I think there are some strategies like that that we can um, share and encourage, which would be very effective to uh, dealing with the, you know, putting the set of opportunities, I guess, for access and also making it easier for people who haven't um, played those roles in other organizations, as many of us presumably have, uh, to, to make this their first time in, you know, in uh, such a position. And there's a note of um, Chris, um, and Chris is missing. Okay, fine. Um, but Chris was talking about this, where as the, as the new Autodesk representative, that the person that they had being the representative initially, initially was, you know, more of an open source advocate. And now you have someone who is, you know, senior director of the product stuff. I can easily imagine this as well for us of where, you know, there's a usual suspect usual suspects aspect to the people that are sitting around this table, but over time it might become easier to hand that off to people inside your organization who are not like you, but that have a lot to contribute to this thing. And that could be the sort of handing it off. And Daniel and I talked about the notion of like, could you timeshare a position on the TAC or something? So that's a, a way towards that. Well, the other thing too is that Technically, I think you could join the TAC, they just don't, wouldn't have voting rights. So you could have more than one person, I mean. Right, but they don't want to go to all, like the, it's a commitment, it's every, you know, every two weeks and stuff like that. But if you said to them every two months or every three months, that's a different. Yeah, so I'd like to add a little bit uh, to the discussion here. So 
A lot of this has to do with uh, building a new pipeline or building the pipeline that's more diverse, more inclusive, go look in places we don't ordinarily look because, and Emily and I were talking about this earlier, in that um, in, in our open source world in our industry, you know, most of the people already know about our open source software so, and, and are involved you know, to, to a certain degree. So where else can we go? So I'm actually the one that put up uh, on the, the board there, you know, partner with uh, other uh, diversity and inclusion initiatives and it just so happens the academy has a diversity and inclusion program. Actually, we have a number of them. The, the one I've got in mind is the Academy Gold Talent Development Program, and some of the companies involved in the Software Foundation or even in not members but around the table here participate in that, and that's an internship program directed towards uh, college-age uh, uh, students, and there's a follow-on mentorship program with that, and I'm, I'm a little sad to report that SciTech has a kind of tiny, tiny representation, you know, within the program. It's a lot of uh, production uh, type jobs. So I think there's a real opportunity to uh, get visible there and help build that pipeline and maybe even find some people that really don't know about all of this. So just, just a thought, and I know there are uh, other programs within the studios and a lot of the companies uh, that participate here and we could potentially leverage all that and uh, change uh, change the face of, I like all the faces in the room, but you know, we, we need some more diverse ones, right? To your point, um, I'm at Marvel Studios and I'm a member of the Academy of Culture. Yeah, Marvel Studios. Hi, I didn't introduce myself before because I was eating a sandwich. Um, I'm Danielle, I'm at Marvel Studios and we're actually a member of the Academy Gold program and this year when we put in for an intern, we asked for a uh, computer a uh, science major and um, because we realized that we had more computer science needs than production needs. So that's what we did. It's a good idea. Fantastic. Thanks for uh, following the uh, the pitch here. You know, we've had one success story that I relate with Christina. Um, there was another former colleague that I reached out to a while ago, um, try to talk into you know, getting involved with the project. And I think I didn't do a good enough job of kind of selling her on um, what's in it for her, you know, what um, I participate because it's fun. And, you know, a lot of the, the hours that I put in are not actually covered by the company. It's just um, we do it because we, we enjoy it. And I mean, just, I hate to use the word networking, but it's networking. It's the people you get to know. And I think that's a really valuable thing. I think it, that's a carrot that we can hang out there for people um, just as an opportunity to, you know, rub shoulders, get to know other people. Um, I, but I think we need to be a little clearer about that proposition of what's in it for them. Um, you know, for the Open EXR steering committee, you know, in almost a year, we've, we've never voted on anything, you know, the actual sort of voting um, aspect of the steering committee is just not something that we ever, we just figure out what to do and do it kind of implicitly. I feel like that offering somebody a, you know, not just, you know, here, fix some bugs and check them in, um, you know, and we'll thank you for it. Um, go a little bit further and say, you know, we'll give you this title. I think that's a, that's something that we can easily do with little downside to the project. Yeah, I mean, if I would actually parallel in some of the other communities that I work with, that's, that's exactly how things start. Um, you know, a community has a need. Um, there's usually somebody new coming to the community doesn't know all the ins and outs of that project, but somebody within there is willing to work with them to help them get to that point. And then they're building that knowledge up. They're able to sort of, you know, rise within the project naturally and then they're able to give that back, you know, kind of repay that back in sort of the next round around. So um, while I, I will always say on diversity on one front, you had to have a very conscious look at it. Um, by the other half of it, um, sometimes it can just be very pragmatically right in front of you of things to take advantage of. And I think, I think Christine is a really great story of somebody who just popped in there and I think is a really central figure to the project right now. <clears throat> That's great. So thank you, Andy. We will look into the Academy Gold Talent Initiative. Is that what it's called? Talent Development Program. Talent Development Program. We'll look into that and circulate it. 
and thank you for everyone for filling up the survey that gives us more data points and that's something that we will focus on as we move forward moving on to the next topic engaging with the developer community developers so we have our group we have our family and um, but there's a lot more a lot many more developers out there um, they probably know about the academy software foundation uh, most of them by now but many of them are very busy in their daily life and many of them not involved with open source software is are there new ways that we can engage with the software engineers in our industry pay them that's a good that's a good start. I, I assume that means uh, using some of our dollars to uh, to hire some of them. If um, you want to add some color to your comment, don't hesitate. I have a, I'm going to write it, but I'm going to say it first, a crazy idea. Should we think about um, having an award of some type? So someone wrote it, I'll get my vote. Um, for the best software development, the best open source software development of the year as part of the SciTech Awards. Sure, we can investigate that. <laughs> uh. Naive as it may sound, I think it, there might be some value in having a small space for the foundation at the SciTech ceremony and just, you know, mention it. I don't know that. Yeah. The real. You, yeah. Yeah. So last year at the SciTech Awards, we did have a um, kind of a PSA type of promo reel. And it was also part of the discussion with Emily earlier is, uh, and we have more time to plan for that because the awards have been moved to June. Yeah. Uh, exactly. This year. So our outreach committee, you know, can uh, give some thought to what's, what's the message and considering the audience and what you want to accomplish. So, so we know we've got that. The idea of, you know, some kind of um, uh, compatible award, that, that's a whole other topic. We do have some people that are on the SciTech Awards uh, main committee, steering committee as well here that uh, might consider that. They'd be better suited to do that than I would. I'm going to make a provocative statement and say that the uh, the people that are involved in um, judging and attending and winning the SciTech Awards overlaps very strongly with the people already involved in ASWF. So I don't, yeah, I don't know how much that's good for engaging in people who aren't already aware of or part of the process. I, I don't just, just throw that out there. Strongly agree with that sentiment, Larry unless there was some other way that the awards were broadcast or something to a broader audience. Yeah. Well, to, to that point, um, if there was something like that, then we could uh, communicate this to the broader engineering community. And, you know, the SciTech Award currently are not about certain categories of things in the past, but if there was something that was about software engineering this year, you have a project, submit it you can win in a word and it can be something um different than a plaque or the the uh, but we could take something like that and then broadcast it uh, to the larger group of folks perhaps there's a question from the zoom that says could the foundation help push trusted partner network to open up for directly contributing to the projects for studios behind strict security restrictions? I believe it would help at least smaller studios without a large development department contribute. I, I'm not sure I understand what's the limitation. Uh, if you, uh, 
uh, no access, no direct access to the internet to download open source libraries and compile them within your production environment. TPN doesn't, doesn't stop downloads, it stops uploads. It's the other direction that's problematic, and, and I don't think it's problematic uh, for some. I think that's the nature of the point. So it's if, you, if the developers want to contribute, then that's an upload from their own network. Yeah. Okay, how can you contribute directly from the network if part of your FTE job is to do yeah. this coding? I, yeah, I shouldn't comment any further. Not an issue. So I don't want my developers to upload. I want to sign off the upload, and the CLAs are there for that reason. Yeah, there that shouldn't happen. Is some ongoing discussion off mic here, which I won't uh, repeat for the room. But thank you. I will say uh, that was part of uh, a point that I tried to capture with promote modern software development processes and environments. Um, I think. That Actually getting to the point, uh, clearly organizations need to and want to have controls about contribution, but that ideally those things are, you know, as, as we always say, they should be uh, the domain of policy rather than just, you know, fr frustration and friction. Um, and that there are definitely things that we can do as we have done with some of the choices we made for CI, for example, <coughs> excuse me, um, which make it much simpler for people to engage. And uh, one of the, consequences, I think, of the security environment we have worked in um, is that, our, you know, many of the technologies we use are a little bit isolated and different from what, you know, uh, developers are working with elsewhere or, you know, people are learning in school. And there's definitely an opportunity for us to try and actually make sure that, um, you know, developing on our projects and, uh, you know, is a comfortable and modern experience. And similarly, and this speaks to the sort of download uh, side of the, the, the question as well, uh, that the security policies that are in place in studios are not detrimental to workflows that developers typically use. And that means, you know, um, sensible and realistic access to, uh, you know, source code and data repositories and other things, um, you know, where that makes sense and under whatever uh, specific restrictions studios want to impose. But, you know, I, I guess the question I have uh, for the room as well is, you know, is that something that the ASWF can meaningfully take as its mandate to try and advocate for, you know, effective software development environments and workflows within our industry? Actually, I took one point from what you said. Should we talk to educational institution to show the, maybe the advanced students how to do software development at this scale? Because you're right, I've never seen it taught, but People that are leaving university at 23, they should have a sense that this is how larger organizations operate. Yeah. And I don't know that they do. And instead, they, at least there should be some availability for somebody to follow a course or, or something on this. That's, that's bringing mountain to my habit or vice versa. But yes, that's no, the no, other way of approaching it, right? Yeah. yeah. But I do agree, and not just because we work at the same company, um, that, uh, <laughs> that that's a good idea to, uh, to use the foundation to be able to say reach out to the TPN or CD CSA because a lot of like Larry was saying there's a lot of overlap between a lot of these people on these committees and uh, establishing some clear workflows that are essentially automatic like that would be passing a TPN uh, audit would be valuable I think to not just the large players who have already figured it out for themselves but to the smaller players all right <clears throat> Well noted, thank you. 15 minutes left in our uh, meeting. I would like to ask if um, you have new member companies, new companies that could become members of the foundation. And um, there's the poll, if there are companies that are not here that you think we should be looking into. We'll make it short. That's a good one. It's a software vendor studios and to the point of our goal to go for general members and smaller studios, smaller studios that you know that are starting to use open source or thinking about contributing, don't know necessarily how. This is good.
Any new names there? I'll give you 10 more seconds before we move on to the next topic. All right. Three, two, one. Moving on. Working group. So we have to talk about this one as it's been a, a topic at uh, multiple level today. So working groups, we want to start doing working groups. We have a basic process for managing them along the lines of those budgets that we described before. And we've spoken about USD. And um, so first I'd like to provide the opportunity for everyone to list topics that you think we should do US group, uh, working group on. So res was mentioned, one person read res, write res um, as one of the options, please. Or I'll do it. So only vote for the res that has a vote already. And as we continue that, and um, we, we stated our intent to help USD, um, I'd like to invite Steve, who is uh, at Pixar in, in charge of USD, to maybe tell us, Steve, if you want, how do you think, at this point, the foundation can best help you as you're developing USD moving forward? Full disclosure, I haven't really thought that much about it. I just kind of started talking to Rob in the last few days, actually, about the idea. Um, we, uh, we definitely could use more help. So we're, we're very overwhelmed, both emotionally, um, positively, by the, the adoption and excitement around USD. And we're also overwhelmed from an engineering standpoint. Uh, we, we do spend a lot of time, uh, engineers just maintaining the forums and responding to questions. They're very invested and dedicated and they feel like they're the ones that have to answer. So, and, and I realize that we're still building, other studios are still building and vendors are building expertise about USD, but it'd be great to have um, help with that so that our engineers could, could kind of offload some of, even just the forum discussion would be a, would be a huge, a huge help as well as, of course, helping us deal with, um, with closing issues, et cetera. Um, I, I haven't really thought about exactly how we would do this, but we, I mean, like I said, we would, we would certainly welcome additional help. And if it, if it made sense, we could maybe do something at, we, we could host a thing at Pixar or somewhere else where we could also kind of bring in people who could potentially help us more, maybe to give a, a additional a training or discussion with the original developers to learn more about USD. I mean, I'm open to any ideas around that. Okay, that's great. Um, and, and so are we in the idea of um, doing a, a session as part of the formation of this working group and what is it that it could do? To start with a, a meeting at Pixar or with a number of uh, people from your team and, and uh, people in the foundation who have expertise, people like John and others um, at the foundation that have operated working groups in all kinds of different, Emily also, in all kinds of different groups um, in larger industry like the automotive industry and, and other software um, industry. We can then listen more closely about what, what is needed, what we can do from our position and uh, put that in right in into the goals of that particular working group. Um, John, Emily, you have experience in these other industries, um, are there something you want to mention about that in, to, in terms of models that we could take to get it started? Um, it's 
excuse me here. Uh, yes. Um, I think it would be good to probably, and maybe Steve, have maybe a little bit of a conversation on some of the background, just sort of understanding some of the, the, the people at play here um, to dig into it. But it's certainly something we've done um, both in topical areas, we've also done it vertically. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that it can be modeled. Um, the nice thing is that this flows within sort of the natural technical community structure. So it's something that flows within the TAC. Um, so you're kind of getting all the right connection points there. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, there's, I guess the short answer is yes, but um, these also things, each one's a little bit different. So it's probably good just to understand all the details. And we certainly want to customize um, given that it's our first one, we have that opportunity to really adapt it to to the need of this of this specific project that we want to support. I also wonder, David, if it might be interesting to spend a bit of time before we kick it off or kick off it on site, just understanding what the goal of that group is. That was one thing I loved in the description of the working group. It had a goal, and the word USD is not a goal, right? So, what is the goal of that group? Is the goal to, to help scale and support the USD project is the goal to put some things around the project so it's easier for studios to uh, invest in um, and kind of integrate into their pipeline or is the goal something else, right? Because I think if we're clear on what we're trying to do, it may suggest a way of, of, of getting there. So I, I was thinking about that when they said that, which, and again, I the same response of where it's like, oh, you know, it's time boxed and it's trying to solve a problem. And so one of the things I was writing down with some notes on that is we should, that group should not try and address the things that are still very much in play of like, you know, programmable materials and coding them in their animation curves, rigging, like those are a lot of things that people would like to do with USD, but they're not on the, you know, or some of them are being worked on, that. but there's a whole bunch of things like backlot assets. Like how do you organize a given asset in a really nicely well-structured USD way? Like what kind of layers should you have? You know, should you be using subdivision surfaces? Should you have variants on the preview? So like there's things of where like the pieces are all out there. Different studios probably have different opinions on that. But if we could be showing some reasonable best practice so some studio that was considering it would be like oh that's a yeah we could do that you know and that's not exactly the way the big dogs at you know at pixar disney or or analogic or whatever are doing it but it's it's a reasonable way to do it that could be really helpful i think yeah. and just to be clear like i love uh, the suggestion we're going to start from rob of you know jumping in and helping in the forums like i'm not, definitely not against helping and we're, we're trying to do a little bit of that uh, from the auditor side as well but i just think it would be interesting to just make sure we understand what people would love to, to get out of that before we assume a direction and jump in. I'll agree. So one area I'm curious about, and I think Gordon's question is, is, is very acute. Um, with USD, there are obviously sort of many, many facets. And uh, if you look at the forums, uh, much discussed, there are definitely different sort of themes or threads of discussion there. Some are of the, um, you know, how do I do this variety? And that's, you know, fairly obvious that uh, as the knowledge in the community rises, then particularly if, um, you know, encouraged and empowered, then other individuals outside of Pixar can definitely contribute usefully there. But uh, what also happens a lot is that, you know, there are much more difficult questions of, um, how do I do this where the answer is not a technical one, but a, you know, a matter of sort of philosophy or best practice or, uh, you know, schema design to put things into a particularly USD kind of uh, context. And in that space, I guess there's an obvious question. Well, um, would we think about, you know, a working group or some other structure, um, you know, offering some kind of environment for decisions of those choices? I mean, you could easily kind of, uh, probably put a chill up everyone's spine by sort of calling this a, you know, the architecture review board kind of analogy. But I think as USD grows, something of that nature is necessary and that can be separate from project adoption. It can be quite separate from project adoption. And it might make sense, and I think I've kind of heard a few people say this, is to, to think about the working groups, um, maybe also within the dimension, I think somebody mentioned, I think maybe it was Gordon Yu is like a time bound um, activity. Um, so there's a clear goal up front this is what we're trying to achieve out of it. This is, you know, the deliverable that we're expecting to come out of it. Um, and this is sort of the general timeline that we know that we're expecting to get it done in. 
Um, and it also kind of helps center the group because I think that's always one of the anti patterns with working groups is it just becomes a group that just keeps on going on, going on. Um, and you really want it to be make sure it's delivering value back to the project and it's delivering value back to the community. So um, the beauty is this model, you can spin up as many as you want. So if, maybe if you need six around USD to um, attack all the main key points, that's something that can potentially be done. Um, and just uh, so the time bound, I think, is, is critical. Um, just as a, an interesting data point, I've done a fair bit of uh, research recently around innovation models in software development in our company. And the, the magic number a lot of people settle on is three months. Like if you go past three months and say, okay, you guys have this goal in a year or two years to, or just no time at all, it'll just meander. Whereas, okay, it's a big problem, let's break it down. What are we trying to get done in three months or one month? Like pick, pick a time, pick a goal. Doesn't have to be the whole problem. Where are we starting? Um, and then I think it'd be great to maybe as part of defining our maturing our working group model to have some way for that to kind of connect back both across the TAC and the governing board so that we can kind of get that, that high level steering ha happening as well. That's good. Short time frame. This is great feedback and we, um, we will form the working group um, shortly and we will uh, reach out to Pixar and uh, define what uh, these parameters should be to help USD, a key project in our industry. I think we all know that and we all know why, um, but it's worth stating again, because here we have a high level system and data structure for movie motion picture projects that if it was adopted widely would make it much easier to uh, exchange data, uh, movie data between different uh, projects. And there's a great value to that as content, content is exploding and the demands on production are becoming ever more uh, stringent to deliver faster and better. And there is a lot of opportunity for interaction between the movie projects and all sorts of other media. Um, USD is coming at a time where it is needed. And uh, here in our neutral platform, um, this is a place where we can help when the, there's a project like this that happens. That's our intent. So we'll see how we go about it. And um, there's, the, there's the slide. So universal scene description, how can we help Pixar with USD? There's some item here. Include USD sessions at open source day is one simple action item that we should probably do for SIGGRAPH and um, highlight the work of USD early adopters. So many of you and um, give a way to um, a forum, use our megaphone, use our website, use our outreach budget to start putting forward um, the good example of USD use in a similar way that we're highlighting the work of software engineers. We can highlight success stories alongside with Pixar. Sample data sets. It certainly uh, would be useful. I can share a little bit of our experience at Epic Games um, implementing USD, which is known that we are working on that. And um, sample data set and also users of USD, um, where are they, how to find them, uh, is a question that engineers have had. And um, of course, we can all go to Pixar. Perhaps that's part of one of the one of the issues that at Pixar, you have a lot of demand coming from everywhere. And if we can help um, in some way alleviate that demand so you can focus on engineering USD, is something that would be good.
that's you. All right. And more seconds on that one. Thank you. This will be very helpful as we tackle our working group. No one's put up just send Pixar more money. Send, send, in there. send Pixar more money? Yeah, they need it. Some oh. <laughs> okay. It's just a suggestion. All right. Give Pixar money. You can write that. Wait, Steve, then check out the to SMA. Is that how that works? <laughs> yeah, I can give you the information <laughs> afterwards. All right. Yep, Venmo. All right. <laughs> so before we're too much over time, here's the last one. So this was our second forum. We covered a lot of ground. We covered some high level thinking. We updated everyone on our projects and the great core work that is done in the tech. We discussed different topics. Is there anything here that we did not touch on that we should have? Is the last question of the day. After that, we're done with the meeting. It would be nice if it stayed blank. Oops. All right. So I have a question. Does the first line mean that the foundation should like hold the one island kind of thing? Like have the one island on on the yeah. foundation servers? Is yeah. that the idea? I wrote that one, so yes, that's what I yeah. mean. <laughs> Some stuff that so people who are trying to understand whether they're a vendor or they're an artist, um, like what what qualifies? Like what you know? It's like oh, she should have. 4K textures, or you should have, you should use UDIMs, or you should have the, in, in examples of things of where, you know, use subdivision surfaces, uh, organize it this way, these sorts of naming conventions. If you're not in the industry, have some place you could look at that you'd be like, oh, those are the kinds of things that people would expect. Yeah, yeah that, that was the same, uh, uh, the schools and, and Daniel's point on, on software development, but you're right, I mean, the, the asset structure, same thing. Like, the guys in, that, that are teaching the schools don't know this stuff, right? And, we can certainly explain to them what they need to distribute. Yeah, and you could imagine that being something that studios would be like, oh, sure, we'll ha even if it's just new stuff that they're going to put their people on to make, you know, like this is what we would consider to be what, what we would expect. Yeah. It, you know, it, it, oh, I mean, a few years ago, Larry showed up at, I want to say it was Seagraph New Orleans and said we should make a shared asset and then, you know, Eventually, Disney shared the, the Moana Island, but another idea that was ventilated at the time was to host students in the studios and drive them to building an asset that was meant to be shared from day one, but it was financed, you know, in collaboration with educational institutions. Yeah, that's the, the kitchen scene in USD was made by a bunch of students at Pixar yeah, one right. summer. Yeah, yeah that, that kind of pattern, right? We discussed the same idea for uh, simulation, but it never happened. That is uh, the last question that I have. And it concludes, if there's nothing else, it concludes our meeting for the uh, second forum of the Academy Software Foundation. We hope to see you uh, at SIGGRAPH uh, for our open source day. That's our next big event. And in a year, be back here. And it's our intention to grow the, our community, both physically and online so that we can give these updates um, and uh, let it be known the work that's been done here in the foundation if you have comments and suggestions how to improve the format also don't hesitate to let us know and thank you very much both you here physically and online for joining us for this amount of time thank and, you yeah and real quick if you need parking validation on your way out there will be security at the security desk they'll have validation for you thank you very much
if the mic is still hot, great. Uh, we've spoken a lot about the TAC today, and I did want to encourage or invite everyone to stay for the TAC meeting that is actually going to start at 4 p.m. Uh, in this room. Yes, and it's on a different Zoom, so we'll shut this Zoom down and we'll start up the other one here momentarily. Thank you all who are on the phone.